Chapters 12 and 13 of A Comic History of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. A Comic History of the United States by Bill Nye. Chapter 12 Personality of Washington it would seem that a few personal remarks about george washington at this point might not be out of place later on his part in this history will more fully appear the author points with some pride to a study of washington's great act in crossing the delaware from a wax work of great accuracy the reader will avoid confusing washington with the author who is dressed in a plaid suit and on the shore while washington may be seen in this end of the boat with the air of one who has just discovered the location of a glue factory on the side of the river a directory of washington's headquarters has been arranged by the author of this book and at a reunion of the general's body servants to be held in the future the work will be on sale the name of George Washington has always had about it a glamour that made him appear more in the light of a god than a tall man with large feet and a mouth made to fit an old-fashioned, full-dress pumpkin pie. George Washington's face has beamed out upon us for many years now, on postage stamps and currency, in marble and plaster and in bronze, and photographs of original portraits, paintings, and stereoscopic views we have seen him on horseback and on foot on the warpath and on skates playing the flute cussing his troops for their shiftlessness and then in the solitude of the forest with his snorting war horse tied to a tree engaged in prayer we have seen all these pictures of george till we are led to believe that he did not breathe our air or eat american groceries but George Washington was not perfect. I say this after a long and careful study of his life, and I do not say it to detract the very smallest iota from the proud history of the father of his country. I say it simply so that the boys of America who want to become George Washington's will not feel so timid about trying it. When I say that George Washington, who now lies so calmly in the lime kiln at Mount Vernon, could reprimand and reproach his subordinates, at times, in a way to make the ground crack open and break up the ice in the Delaware a week earlier than usual, I do not mention it in order to show the boys of our day that profanity will make them resemble George Washington. That was one of his weak points, and no doubt he was ashamed of it as he ought to have been some poets think that if they get drunk and stay drunk they will resemble edgar a poe and george d prentice there are lawyers who play poker year after year and get regularly skinned because they have heard that some of the able lawyers of the past century used to come home at night with poker chips in their pockets whiskey will not make a poet nor poker a great pleader and yet I have seen poets who relied on the potency of their breath, and lawyers who knew more of the habits of a bobtail flush than they ever did of the statues in such case made and provided. If you wanted a man to be first in war, you could call on George. If you desired an adult who would be first baseman in time of peace, Mr. Washington could be telephoned at any hour of the day or night. If you needed a man to be first in the hearts of his countrymen, George's post office address was at once secured. Though he was a great man, he was once a poor boy. How often you hear that in America! Here it is, a positive disadvantage to be born wealthy. And yet, sometimes, I wish they had experimented a little that way on me. I do not ask now to be born rich, of course, because it is too late. But it seems to me that, with my natural good sense and keen insight into human nature, I could have struggled along under the burdens and cares of wealth with great success. I do not care to die wealthy, but if I could have been born wealthy, it seems to me I would have been tickled almost to death. 
i love to believe that true greatness is not accidental to think and to say that greatness is a lottery is pernicious man may be sometimes wrong in his judgment of others both individually and in the aggregate but he who gets ready to be a great man will surely find the opportunity you will wonder whom i got to write this sentiment for me but you will never find out in conclusion let me say that george washington was successful for three reasons one was that he never shook the confidence of his friends another was that he had a strong will without being a mule some people cannot distinguish between being firm and being a big blue donkey another reason why washington is loved and honored today is that he died before we had a chance to get tired of him this is greatly superior to the method adopted by many modern statesmen who wait till their constituency weary of them and then reluctantly pass away End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen contrasts with the present day here it may be well to speak briefly of the contrast between the usages and customs of the period preceding the revolution and the present day some of these customs and regulations have improved with the lapse of time others undoubtedly have not two millions of people constituted the entire number of whites while away to the westward the red brother extended indefinitely religiously they were protestants and essentially they were a god-fearing people taught to obey a power they were afraid of they naturally turned with delight to the service of a god whose genius in the erection of a boundless and successful hell challenged their admiration and esteem so too their own executions of divine laws were successful as they gave pain and the most beautiful features of christianity namely love and charity according to history were not cultivated very much there were in new england at one time twelve offences punishable with death and in virginia seventeen this would indicate that the death penalty is getting unpopular very fast and that in the contiguous future humane people will wonder why murder should have called for murder in this brainy charitable and occult age in which man seems almost able to pry open the future and catch a glimpse of destiny underneath the great tent that has heretofore held him off by means of death's prohibitory rates in hartford people had to get up when the town watchman rang his bell the affairs of the family and private matters too numerous to mention were regulated by the selectmen the catalogues of harvard and yale were regulated according to the standing of the family as per record in the old country and not as per bust measurement and merit as it is to-day scolding women however were gagged and tied to their front doors so that the populace could bite its thumb at them and hired girls received fifty dollars a year with the understanding that they were not to have over two days out each week except sunday and the days they had to go and see their sick sisters some cloth weaving was indulged in and homespun was the principal material used for clothing mrs washington had sixteen spinning wheels in her house her husband often wore homespun while at home and on rainy days sometimes placed a pair of homemade trousers of the barn door variety in the presidential chair money was very scarce and ammunition very valuable in sixteen thirty five musket balls passed for farthings and to see a new england peasant making change with the red brother at thirty yards was a common and delightful scene the first press was set up in cambridge in sixteen thirty nine with the statement that it had come to stay books printed in those days were mostly sermons filled with the most comfortable assurance that the man who let loose his intellect and allowed it to disbelieve some very difficult things would be essentially well i hate to say right here in a book what would happen to him the first daily paper called the federal orary was issued three hundred years after columbus discovered america 
it was not popular and killed off the newsboys who tried to call it on the streets so it perished there was a public library in new york from which books were loaned at four pence halfpenny per week new york thus became very early the seat of learning and soon afterwards began to abuse the site where chicago now stands travel was slow the people went on horseback or afoot and when they could go by boat it was regarded as a success wagons finally made the trip from new york to philadelphia in the wild time of forty-eight hours and the line was called the flying dutchman or some other euphonious name benjamin franklin whose biography occurs in chapter fifteen was then postmaster general he was the first bald-headed man of any prominence in the history of america he and his daughter sally took a trip in a chaise looking over the entire system and going to all offices nothing pleased the postmaster general like quietly slipping into a place like sandy bottom and catching the postmaster reading over the postal cards and committing them to memory calfskin shoes up to the revolution were the exclusive property of the gentry and the rest wore cowhide and were extremely glad to mend them themselves these were greased every week with tallow and could be worn on either foot with impunity rights and lefts were never thought of until after the revolutionary war but to-day the american shoe is the most symmetrical comfortable and satisfactory shoe made in the world the british shoe is said to be more comfortable possibly for a british foot it is so but for a foot containing no breathing apparatus or viscera it is somewhat roomy and clumsy farmers and laborers of those days wore green or red bays in the shape of jackets and their breeches were made of leather or bed ticking our ancestors dressed plainly and a man who could not make over two hundred pounds per year was prohibited from dressing up or wearing lace worth over two shillings per yard it was a pretty sad time for literary men as they were thus compelled to wear clothing like the common laborers lord cornwallis once asked his eighty kong why the american poet always had such an air of listening as if for some expected sound i give it up retorted the eighty kong it is said lord cornwallis as he took a large drink from a jug which he had tied to his saddle because he is trying to see if he cannot hear his bed ticking on the following day he surrendered his army yet the laws were very stringent in other respects besides apparel a man was publicly whipped for killing a fowl on the sabbath in new england in order to keep a tavern and sell rum one had to be of good moral character and possess property which was a good thing the names of drunkards were posted up in the alehouses and the keepers forbidden to sell them liquor no person under twenty years of age could use tobacco in connecticut without a physician's order and no one was allowed to use it more than once a day and then not within ten miles of any house it was a common thing to see large picnic parties going out into the back woods of connecticut to smoke will the reader excuse me a moment while i light up a peculiarly black and redolent pipe only the gentry were called mr and mrs this included the preacher and his wife a friend of mine who was one of the gentry of this century got on the trail of his ancestry last spring and traced them back to where they were not allowed to be called mr and mrs and fearing he would catch up in scotland yard if he kept on he slowly unrolled the bottoms of his trousers got a job on the railroad and since then his friends are gradually returning to him he is well pleased now and looks humbly gratified even if you call him a gent the scriptures were literally interpreted and the old testament was read every morning even if the ladies fainted the custom yet noticed sometimes in country churches and festive gatherings of placing the males and females on opposite sides of the room was originated not so much as a punishment to both as to give the men an opportunity to act together when the red brother felt at ease 
I am glad the red brother does not molest us nowadays and make us sit apart that way. Keep away, red brother. Remain on your reservation, please, so that the pale face may sit by the loved one and hold her little soft hand during the sermon. Church services meant business in those days. People brought their dinners and had a general penitential gorge. Instrumental music was prescribed as per Amos 5th chapter and 23rd verse, and the length of prayer was measured by the physical endurance of the performer. The preacher often boiled down his sermon to four hours, and the sexton upended the hourglass each hour. Boys who went to sleep in church were sandbagged and grew up to be border murderers. New York people were essentially Dutch. New York gets her Santa Claus, her donuts, crullers, cookies, and many of her odors from the Dutch. The New York matron ran to fine linen and polished door knockers, while the New England housewife spun linsey woolsey and knit yarn mittens for those she loved. Philadelphia was the largest city in the United States and was noted for its cleanliness and generally sterling qualities of mind and heart, its Sabbath trance and clean white doorsteps. The southern colonies were quite different from those of the north in place of thickly settled towns there were large plantations with african villages near the house of the owner the proprietor was a sort of country squire living in considerable comfort for those days he fed and clothed everybody black or white who lived on the estate and waited patiently for the colored people to do his work and keep well so that they would be more valuable the colored people were blessed with children at a great rate so that at this writing, though voteless, they send a large number of members to Congress. This cheers the southern heart and partially recoups him for his chickens. The South, then, as now, cured immense quantities of tobacco, while the North tried to cure those who used it. Washington was a Virginian. He packed his own flour with his own hands, and it was never inspected. People who knew him said that the only man who ever tried to inspect Washington's flower was buried under a hill of choice watermelons at Mount Vernon. Along the James and Rappahannock, the vast estates often passed from father to son according to the law of entail, and such a thing as a poor man prior to the war must have been unknown. Education, however, flourished more at the north, owing partly to the fact that the people lived more in communities. Governor Berkeley of Virginia was opposed to free schools from the start, and said, I thank God there are no free schools nor printing presses here, and I hope we shall not have them these hundred years. His prayer has been answered. End of chapter 13